Last night, you slept on it. Many of you were wearing it in bed and you stepped out onto it. Some of you sat on it to take your first pee this morning. Many of you brushed your teeth with it and some of your toothpaste even contains it. Some of you were looking at me through it. You're all sitting on it. It's all around us. Of course, the ear time talking about is plastic. And if you ever wanted evidence that we're in the middle of a plastic epidemic, just take a good look around you now. We love it though, don't we? It's useful, I mean it's all around us, it's versatile and it's flexible, it's, it's waterproof. We use it for most of the products that we have. It was developed in the 1920s for industry and by the end of the war, by the 1950s, we were producing 1.7 million tonnes of the stuff. This year we'll produce well over 300 million tonnes of the stuff. And that figure's set to double in the next 20 years. I mean, it would be quite a business success story. Or it should be, shouldn't it? It should be on the cover of all of our magazines, all over our news, in our newspapers. And it probably would be if it weren't for the downsides <coughs> to plastic production. 40% of all that we produce will end up in our landfill sites, taking up valuable space. 10 to 20 million tonnes of the stuff will end up this year in our oceans. That's the equivalent of one rubbish truck filled full of plastic driving up to our seaside and dumping its contents into our oceans every year. That plastic, well, that's responsible for over 100,000 sea life animal deaths. Seabirds, whales, dolphins, turtles, all eating, ingesting our plastic that we throw away and then getting washed up on our shores. There was a study done by Five Gyres that uh, estimated that there are five trillion bits of plastic floating in our oceans today. Five trillion. I didn't think a trillion was a real number, to be honest. I thought someone had made it up. It's funny to think, or, well, not so funny as the case may be, that every molecule of plastic that's ever been produced is still here on Earth today. It takes our plastics hundreds, some of it thousands of years, for it to degrade. Good news is, it's not all about the bad news. I'll take that picture away from you. Because I really believe that th there is another way. I was in India a number of years ago, working with a charity that um, helped pickers on a landfill site. A picker's job is they're given a long stick with a spike on the end and they go to landfill sites and they pick out various items that can be reused or recycled by various people. One guy I was hearing about, he was known as the Plastic Man, which I thought was really cool, you know, like a superhero kind of title. And he was buying up vast quantities of plastic bottles. And when he was asked, well, what are you doing with those old plastic bottles? He simply replied with, I'm saving lives. I mean, that's a proper superhero job, isn't it? Not just the title, but he's actually doing the job as well. And I thought, I'd like to know more about that. In May 2015, India was hit by a severe heat wave, which caused the death of over 2,500 people. And it left many suffering with heat exhaustion. And I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I watch these things on the news. The enormity of it is too much for me. I can't come up with any solutions. I, I think a lot about the problems I mean, I can't turn down the temperature in India. I wish I could. If, if I could, maybe I'd be called Thermometer Man, something <laughs> like that, some sort of superhero name. And many of the people that I've met in India, well, they couldn't afford a cold drink, let alone air conditioning units to cool themselves down. But I guess to be a superhero, to save lives, we, we have to think differently. And that's exactly what our plastic man did. And through a series of very simple experiments, he came up with the ultimate solution. Let me share one of those experiments with you now. If you take out your hand and open your mouth wide and you're going to breathe into the palm of your hand. So, you feel how warm your breath is. Now this time, purse your lips and blow into the palm of your hand. So, you'll feel how much cooler that breath is, right? Well, our plastic man simply replaced your mouth with an old plastic bottle. What he did was he took a plastic bottle and he cut the end of it away. I've got the result of his experiments right here. He took the plastic bottle, cut the end off, and put the end of the bottle, the bit you might drink from, into a window frame. 
So what happens is the hot air blows past the fat part of the bottle and is blowing through the small part of the bottle, cooling a room down by up to five degrees, saving lives with old plastic bottles. This is my wallet. I bought it with me today. I use it a lot. It's very useful to me. But my wallet, well, it's different from yours. My wallet was made with this. This old crisp packet that you and I might throw away after a, a one-time use. The people that made my wallet for me, well, they saw this as something that could be turned into something useful again. And from my wallet to my trainers, the trainers that I'm wearing today. Uh, these aren't any ordinary pair of trainers. These trainers were made with waste plastics that they found floating around the oceans in the Maldives. In fact, 11 plastic bottles went into making my trainers. So it isn't just individual thinking that's getting us to this level of change. It's large corporations that are thinking in this way too. And I've noticed a difference. A difference between those that come up with great ideas and somewhere along the line they get kind of lost in the problem and never get to turn it into a reality, which I think is a universal problem, isn't it? Versus those that come up with a great idea and they turn it into a wonderful reality. Well, for those people, they ask a question over and over again, almost annoyingly for some of them. They ask, well, what if? What if there is a way? What if there is a solution? What if there is something that we can do differently? What if? And I thought I'm going to give that a go. I quite like that question, what if? Next time I come up with a problem in my world, I'm going to ask what if. Now, I have a mother-in-law. That's kind of the end of the sentence, really. I'm, I'm looking for sympathy from you, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> in truth, my mother-in-law, she lives just three miles away from my wife and I, and she likes to come and visit. And the road that sits outside of our house, it was full of potholes. And my mother-in-law would come down to our house and she would get the face on. Do you recognise those with mother-in-law? You, you see the face on. And she would start to complain. She would complain that her car was filthy dirty because of the potholes. And then she got a giant bill from the garage because she'd broken the suspension on her car. And she turned to my wife and I and she said, because of the poor quality of your road, I'm not going to come and visit you anymore. Now, I thought this was an absolutely marvellous idea. It was one of the best that she's ever come up with, I'll be honest. But my wife, well, she disagreed. And I had to do something about it. So I called a road resurfacing company in, and they gave me a quote. And I, I very quickly realised that I couldn't afford to do up the road outside of my house. And then I remembered something else that I'd seen in India. Because they have a pothole problem too. In fact, their pothole problem is sometimes worse than our pothole problem. Many of the people that I know in India, they, they drive about on scooters or mopeds or bikes or tuk-tuks. The thing is, when those things hit a pothole, it can be the difference between life and death. And what they were doing is going to the landfill sites and taking out old rubbish, plastic bottles, bags. They were sticking it into the pothole pouring petrol all over it, setting it alight, and melting down the plastic in those potholes. And I thought, that's brilliant, that is, look at that. What if I did that on my road at home? Now, I don't know where you guys live, but the councils around us, they frown upon us, sticking things in potholes and setting a light to them. So <laughs> I had to think differently again. I had to use my what-if question. What if there was a solution? And I got together with a couple of my mates, and between us, we asked this what-if question. What if there was a way to solve the problems that we have with potholes and poor quality roads? What if there was also a way that we could help solve the plastic epidemic that we all live through today? And for 18 months of trials and tests, we asked this what-if question, and we came up with our ultimate solution, a waste plastic pellet where we can use up the waste plastic rubbish that we all throw away and add that waste plastic into our roads to replace part of the bitumen in the mix. The bitumen's the fossil fuel. And then we got the results back. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. The results that we got back are that not only are we able to use up the waste plastic in our roads to make our roads better, but our roads are up to 60% stronger than the roads that you currently drive on because of the waste plastics that we put in. And they're up to 10 times longer lasting. And they don't pothole. My mother-in-law was delighted. Who would have thought it, though? You know, your old rubbish can make our roads stronger and longer lasting. 
And the more that we asked this what-if question, the more that we found more solutions. And councils came to us and they said, we want to use your old rubbish in our roads because it makes them stronger and longer lasting. And now we have opportunities to go around the world. And of course, like anyone else, it wasn't just the what-if question because we had a barrage of people saying, well, that won't work because of this or it because of that. But the more that we asked the what-if question, the more that we came up with more solutions. My daughters attend school in Carlisle in Cumbria, my two little girls, and each week the parents are invited in to attend the school assembly to see our kids perform. And I remember this particular assembly because it was based upon what lives in our oceans. And the, the kids had painted a different picture. And the teacher had gathered the children around and she said, so children, what lives in our ocean? And one little girl put her hand up she said, me miss, me miss, me miss, me miss, me miss. She was very excited. She said, fish miss, yes. They live in our oceans, fish. And then a little boy put his hand up, also excited, and he said, whales and dolphins, miss. Whales and dolphins, they live in our oceans. Never seen them, but they're apparently huge, and they live in our oceans. My little girl put her hand up, and she said, plastics, miss. <laughs> yeah, plastics, they're, they're in our oceans. And then, like you, the teacher kind of sniggered a little bit and took a step back. But in truth, my little girl was right. By the time my little girls are my age, the grand old age of 40, it's expected that there would be more plastics in our oceans than fish themselves. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my little girls growing up in a world where this is the case. So we must revalue, we must reuse and reduce the plastic epidemic that we all live through today. By creating a consistent culture of what-ifs, you can turn your great ideas into a wonderful reality. It's our future and it's our responsibility. What if, just for a moment, what if? What if the what if question can help us create a world that we are proud to hand on to generations still to come? Thank you. <laughs>